we're on live on Facebook, so we could start our little uh, interview. So I'm Judy of Divina Cucina in Tuscany, and I'm very thrilled today to have my uh, culinary inspiration and my kitchen sister, Joanne Weir from San Francisco. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Judy. I love being on with you. I love it. So how are you doing during the COVID? You guys get to travel a little bit, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, COVID, it, it's been really, really tough, but, you know, things are starting to open up and, you know, I have been vaccinated and I just, it, 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 it's much more positive and, you know, you can just feel the energy is much better. It's just much You know, better. as soon as I just heard that there's going to be an American summer school um, in Florence, all of a sudden it felt like a weight came off of my shoulders. Um, I don't know when it's going to open for tourism, but at least that the schools get to reopen. That's a big thing for Florence. So Joanne, yeah. when did you first start traveling with uh, food? That's what I want to know. Oh, traveling with food. Well, you know, I wrote my most recent book was called Kitchen Gypsy, right? And so I think uh, I, and Gypsy came because my father used to call me his wandering gypsy from the time I was like five mm -hmm. years old. And so I don't know if I was necessarily traveling for food then, but I've always loved to travel and, um, you know, and food just was very much a part of it because I'm a fourth generation professional cook. My mother was grandfather, great grandmother. So I hope that answered your question, Judy. Yeah, well, where, um, where were, you're from Massachusetts? Is that where you're from? Yes, yes. I grew up in Western Massachusetts, so Northampton, uh -huh. you know, where Smith College, uh, University of Massachusetts, which is where I went to school, also Amherst College. Um, anyway, so a great um, college town, five universities were there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yes, my grandparents on both sides had farms. And I think oh, that's really where the first love of food and cooking came from is just, in my whole life, it was just, you know, I just everything, every place I went, it was all around food uh, with my family. My mother was kind of obsessed with food, really. And then I remember, of course, um, in the 80s, you were at Chez Panisse, right? Yeah, actually, I started, yes, in 1985, after I studied with Madeleine Kamen in France, Mm -hmm. um, I worked at Chez Panisse. I worked there for five years. And sometimes I say I haven't really left because I still sometimes go back and work there. Like, I don't even care if they say, here, just peel this lug. And I'm telling you, like a lug is a huge box of apples. I'll just do it just to be there because I, I still love being there. So I don't think I've ever really left. I really think that was such a great family too. Cause I worked from 1979, I think to 1984 at the Stanford Court Hotel in San Francisco. Right. And there were kind of like two places you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the Stanford Court, Bradley Ogden came from there. Oh, right. So right. there's like a family from the Stanford Court too. of Jim, uh, Jim Dodge too, right? Jim Dodge. I worked under yes. Jim Dodge in pastry. I started oh, as a cashier in a, a front desk and then cafe. And then I went into pastry. So Jim was my boss. So oh, I love Jim. So there's, I think there's just like a family tree of foodies that you can trace mm -hmm. back um, who their influences were and where they came from. Right. And I, I remember um, my friend, my, kind of like a cousin, was a friend of Paul Bertoli. And right. I think at first, was it Paul Bertoli or was it somebody else I was thinking of? Was Paul at Chez Panisse too? Yeah, Paul was. Paul was the chef in the downstairs restaurant. I worked when Paul was there, I was there. So yeah, um, yeah he was a fantastic chef. I mean, now he owns that fantastic company called Framani. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of obsessed with his smoked ham right now, but he's, he just, he, you know, whatever Paul, he was a fabulous cook. And um, it was fun. That was, he was there the whole time I was there. And didn't he actually bring over his own balsamic vinegar barrels? Yeah, he did. That's right. He did. Yeah. Because I think, and I, I, my memory is shot, right? As soon as you have a birthday, it goes all out downhill. <laughs> but um, I th thought he wanted to work at Chez Panisse and they wouldn't take him and they told him to go get experience. And I think he right. came to Florence to work and he was somebody's private chef here. And right. then he went back and that was just like the opening of life. It's kind of like in what Alice in France, right? You, you right, have to get right. a way to come back and... Yeah, exactly. You know, um, Paul, he also, you know, was a 
came, Bertoli obviously came from a, an Italian family and they know he learned the love of food from his family. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, Alice, the same thing, right? She went to France and came back and then just said, oh, I want to open a restaurant. But, you know, it's kind of fun because I've stayed so close to people at Chez Panisse. I mean, Alice has come to the University of Massachusetts. I'm bringing her, we're doing um, a video. We have this chef's culinary conference and I get to work with her again, um, where I get to interview her. Uh, and it's so, it's just, a, I love everything that she's done. Edible schoolyard. I mean, it's just, you know, I feel like for me, even though I studied very classically, you know, French cooking with Madeleine Kamen, and I don't mean to, I never liked cream and butter. I know you, yeah. you and I've talked about this. Yeah, yeah. Olive oil girl. I mean, you give me olive oil and I'm happy, right? And um, so Chez Panisse was the perfect place after I finished studying with Madeleine for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just, I never really wanted, and she, it was funny because Madeline, she's not alive anymore, but Madeline used to say, well, you really didn't get any, um, any real training in a restaurant. I said, well, I was at Chez Panisse for five years. She goes, that's not, you know, you have to be in a French restaurant. You have to be in a, like a real restaurant. And I said, where? And she goes, go work with Gary Danko. I said, no, Gary's my friend. Like we have different food styles, but anyway, uh, Madeline was a character. Anyway, I was with her for one year getting a master chef diploma. And and, and who was the losses from the Madeline Common School? Wasn't Robert Reynolds? Did he go to Madeline Common? I think he did too, but a lot of people, I mean, but not, I mean, not like Chez Panisse. I mean, the people that came out of Chez Panisse were, you know, just so many uh, great names, you know. David Leibovitz is one. Um, so many. Paul Bertoli, Peggy Smith, um, yeah, Peggy and um, Sue, who own uh, Cowgirl Creamery. Cowgirl Creamery. So many. They just sold, right? So they're yeah. Are they, they retiring did, yeah. or starting something new? No, they I, still they're consulting. I okay. still see it. And uh, yeah, fabulous, geez. So, what was your first book? How many books have you written, and what was your first book? I wrote seventeen. Oh my God. I know it's ridiculous. No, honestly, but 10 of them or nine of them were from for William Sonoma. So I can't say, but I did write, I probably wrote nine books or 10 or I don't even some on my own. And so the very first one was really one of my favorite, favorite books that I wrote called From Tapas to Meze. I was going to say that's, I have, I should have had it right here, but I go to that often. We're talking about how food lets you travel. Right. It's yeah. true. It's so true. But, you know, I wrote that book I, after working at Chez Panisse. I looked at how first courses really were something that around the Mediterranean and in most countries, unless they're, you know, Arab or something that most of the countries, they love to have a drink, but they'll never have a drink without eating something. Exactly. So I, I, that's where that book came from. But seriously, even then I wrote it in 1994 and I would hold up the book. People had an idea of tapas. And I remember people saying, I love this. I'd say, oh, I'm, um, I wrote this book about tapas. And they were like, Joanne, you wrote about going tapas? tapas? Like, I didn't even know what tapas it's was. It's not just me. Whenever I say that too, people look at you first and they go, <laughs> you have to kind of say tapas, you know, not topless. But anyway, in Meze, they had no idea. So that's, yeah. you know, the small plates from the Eastern Mediterranean. But no, I, I, that book is like my firstborn. It's like my baby, you know, I love that book. Anyway. I, I do too. I love it. <laughs> you. Thank you. We all love our firstborn, you know. Because I think also, I think I did it before I started working at the hotel. I did a huge trip and I spent nine months abroad and I actually spent it between wow. Israel and Greece. So really deep into wow. the Mediterranean. Yeah. And I just love that, like you said, the olive oil, the olives, yeah. the um, the flavors are just so intense and probably because of the sun and the soil and everything. But it really affected me. I mean, the oregano is different, right? Yeah. Oh, Everything's no, it's so, so dramatic. But I think that's so cute you said that because you said you made falafel. Yeah, Didn't today I was, I was craving things. So yesterday, <laughs> I, I love was, uh, <laughs> my grandfather was French. So every once in a while I get French cravings, right? So I did for my birthday, I just did a simple uh, duck breast. Yes, happy birthday. I forgot to say it. Yeah, happy birthday. So it was my, yesterday. My mom was raised in China. So I grew up right. eating a lot, a lot of Chinese and Oriental style foods and stuff. She lived around the world. So I wanted a duck breast, which to me is more French. And my yeah. husband's like, hey, I don't like duck, but it's your birthday, so I'll eat it, right? right. And so I did a dry rub with um, the Tuscan drug drug mixture. It's called Droghe Toscani. And it's almost somewhere between like a Chinese five spice. Oh. It's the seasoning yeah. for Panforte. 
Okay, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the Quatre de Peace in France. Right. And here it's something that butchers also use in salami. Oh, and so what are the four? Well, it it, it can be even more. It's France's oh, okay. four, but here it, it's, um, if you think about pumpkin pie spice, right? Okay. Nutmeg and ginger and cinnamon. And this also has coriander. I've seen one with galanga. Wow. Um, yeah, they're really, if they change from town to town, there's one called the Queen Spices and one's called the Tuscan Drugs, but wow! But each one is different. And so yeah. um, I put in the wild fennel pollen also, which, which makes it more Tuscan to me. But to me, right. that almost tastes like star anise. Right, right. So I did a dry rub first and then just pan fried them and served them with some pickled uh, chili peppers I made. It was lovely. So mm. yeah, it sounds, oh, wait, wait, wait. So is Andrea happy with it? Oh, he loved it. Like his <laughs> friends were being crazy. I just see Maria Angela. Hi, Maria Angela. And Lynn Davis, um, I'm looking at everybody up there. It's yeah. great. Ciao. So um, Ciao. it was just kind of fun that we, uh, I made a pavlova for dessert. Oh, wow. That's yeah. great. I haven't done that probably what, in 45 years or something. <laughs> right. But right. I made like I a lemon curd and a pavlova and strawberries. And it was just too sweet for me anymore, but it was pretty. Yeah. You know. Are you getting strawberries now? Oh, beautiful ones now. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's really, I don't get homesick because it's just like California. Asparagus, artichokes, strawberries, right. spring. Yeah. yeah. So what oh, are you know cooking it's... now too? Now that we're all cooking instead of traveling. Um, you know, I, I'm, I cooked, I would say all but about 14 days during COVID for that whole wow. year. Wow. Um, but you know, I did after a year though, I got to the point that I was like, okay, that's enough. And I, I've been cooking very simply. I mean, last night I had merguez sausage with a salad, uh, but exactly. I've been cooking really, really simply, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say that. Over the weekend, it was my stepdaughter's birthday and I made this incredible, I mean, elaborate Moroccan kind of feast. And oh, I did fun. this flatbread with a herb salad on the top, you know, like cilantro and mint and arugula and parsley with a, a preserved lemon vinaigrette. And then I made the four salads. You know how they serve the salads? Yeah. It's the first course in Morocco. So I did those. One that I made that I love is the eggplant jam. And I know it wasn't eggplant season, but I found beautiful eggplants and who knows where they came from. But I was just, I had to have this eggplant jam. And I made a little fennel salad. And, but anyway, and then the main course I did couscous, but usually I make a tagine with, you know, the lamb and the preserved lemons and olive, olives and artichokes, mm -hmm. but I put that with the couscous instead, but I made some little um, kind of merguez kefta, the flavors oh, of merguez sausage. And for dessert, okay, have you ever made the Torta de Santiago? No, I saw you writing about that. Oh, Judy, I have to give you this recipe. I'm like crazy about this recipe. We're going to post it this week. But it is so delicious. Okay, it's gluten-free and dairy-free. You would never know. It is delicious. It's almost chewy. It is the most, you make it with almond flour. But I, you know what I put in it? I kind of uh, went a little sideways with it. You put both almond extract and vanilla. But I decided, and you will relate to this, to put some Fiori di Sicilia in it. I was going to oh say God, flour water. Yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. It's almost got a little bit of vanilla and citrus. Oh, mm -hmm. that is the most beautiful stuff. Well, you know, so, they actually have, um, you know, my friend Gabriella in Sicily. She's uh, an expert on like, she has an orange garden that's incredible. And they have an orange called the vanilla orange. Oh, wow. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Where is she? Um, Castel Vetrano. She's Olio Verde. You know Olio Verde? No. The, the square oh, little... Oh, the square the, little olive coast. bottle that Rolando brings in. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. That first yes, oil yes. that comes, okay, it's made from yes. the Castel Vetrano olives, the Nocciolata And olives. I've met her. I have yeah. met her. Yes. She's yeah, like, yeah. you need to know in Sicily, yeah. Right, yes. Yeah, she's so, so, where is she in Sicily, though? Is she's on Castel the west coast. Castel Vetrano, where the olives are from. Right, right, right. So I'm always on the east coast. That's where I've been working recently. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, close to Taramina, but Catania, I should say. Anyway. Yeah, Castel but, Vetrano oh, is tiny. Tiny. Judy, is it a vanilla sanguino orange? No, sanguinella. Do you well, mean there's a blood a, I'm looking orange? at a blood orange variety of tree that we can get here, and it's vanilla sanguino. Oh, ask blood. her, and I'll email you. Okay. Okay, I'll get back to you. And so, um, 
but wait, I want to tell you the last thing I made. I made a noyo ice cream. So I did the, I had some, I had some apricot pits oh, in the freezer and you yeah. crack them in the pit. And I made a noyo ice cream and it went so well with the, um, that the cake. cake. I'm going to give you that recipe is I love it. And it's like the easiest thing on earth. I was going to say, I have two packages of almond flour here. Um, okay. I'll send I do the, the orange cake, which is the ground oranges and the sugar right. with the almond flour. Yes. Is that, what do you call that? That's not a spormato. No, no, no. Just orange What's it called? Cake. Oh, orange, orange cake. cake. Okay. I mean, everybody makes them differently and um, it is a Sicilian cake originally, right. but then right. I think everybody found out about it when, what was that? Walter Mitty. And they did it with the clementines when they okay. boiled the clementines and then pureed them. I just do raw oranges pureed with sugar right. and then almond well, yeah. flour. There's so many people you know, don't great. eat flour and they don't have this and they don't have that. And so it's just, you know, you have to have some of those, those recipes, especially for sweets that are fabulous, right? Right. Yes. And that's what I think about this torta, but um, that cake sounds wonderful. I and know it, it from? Um, the, the Torta de Santiago is from Spain. Okay. Well, I was going to so say the, 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 the walk, right? It is from the walk. You have it at the end of the walk, I guess, if you do that whole walk. Um, I stayed on the wall in a hotel right by the walk, but I didn't do the whole um, Camino de Santiago. But I, anyway, yeah, that, so the, the dinner was really fun. So I said, I've been cooking simply. I spent the entire day cooking and yeah. even some of the day before. So anyway, you know how well, that I think is. that's it too. When like, it's just Andrea and I, how much are you going to cook? I mean, You're right. You're right. I do get crazy while well going, I'll make like four or five dishes, but then we eat them as little plates. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Like I made a hummus. Um, and I made, I made my own, uh, pita bread because I can't right, buy right. it here. And yeah. I did one with sesame seeds baked in the oven. The other one I griddled. So it would be a little different, but just, yeah. you know, it's just fun. I know. So anyway, I want to ask what about your PBS shows? What's going on there on TV? So, um, yeah, the show. Okay. So 13 shows launched in January. This is the fourth series, uh, called plates and places. And uh, I love this series because I got to film in Italy. We filmed in uh, San Marzano. We filmed, oh, uh, fun. we did in Puglia. We filmed in Puglia and we filmed a lot in Parma. And uh, that was fantastic. But we also filmed in Marrakesh, um, in Greece on the island of Syros, also on the island of Kea in Greece. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we filmed um, in Spain, in Rioja, which was fantastic. So this uh, series is really about my discoveries in my travel. So you know how much I love to travel. Sometimes it was with my groups, and then a lot of times it was just me on, you know, on my own, but uh, or with friends that I have there. And uh, I love the series. So the 13 shows that started in January, um, the last one is really funny because every other one pretty much. Oh, also, sorry, I filmed on the Danube and on the Rhine River. So wow. um, that's a stretch for me. I don't know about you, but that food is definitely different. I mean, I grew up, uh, my father's Lithuanian, so I grew up having sauerkraut and stuff, but that's not really my go-to food, right? But it was fun to kind of come up with recipes because we yeah. filmed uh, on a river ship. So that was fun. But um, the final show, because I filmed everywhere all around my travels, was my home and it's really my kitchen and my deck and you see me running up my stairs because I have 30 stairs as you know to get into my house <laughs> and so it's, it was really like what my life is like in San Francisco because I've for four years I've really just showed my travel so that was fun and it was really the places that I go in San Francisco did you ever know Luca Delicatessen of course, did you know Luca yeah. on Chestnut okay so I filmed with them oh, uh, they're so fantastic and then yeah, and um, so my I made garganelli. I saw my two tenants were on the show with me. Oh, and we nice. made garganelli. I'm telling you, making garganelli is the most incredible pasta to make because people get so excited. You know how it is when they yeah, kind of yeah. have one of those aha moments of oh, I can make that. So that was fun. It was really really great. And we we also did uh, we did a cake. I did an upside down blood orange cake too. Oh, delicious! That was fun. Yeah. Well, I know behind you, you've got all your beautiful ceramics and you've been collecting forever. And I think that's part of the thing about like traveling is bringing home things you can use and serve things on. I agree. And the spices, but also, like you said, recreating that experience. Right. So like the garganelli, it's, you can find them sometimes, but it's a, it's an easy pasta to make if you have the right tools, right? But 
it's so easy. You met Valentina. So, uh -huh. you know, I use her villa in Tuscany and Luca and she's the one, you know, she's from Emilia Romagna. So she taught me how to make that. I love that shape. I don't know. I'm kind of obsessed. But then when um, in Sicily, I was working with um, Dora, who was at the villa that I use and she made a pasta and you, I'm sure use it, make it. She used the spokes to the umbrella. Oh, I love it that you know that. And so you take the little pieces of pasta and you have this way of rolling it, right? That's a little bit more tricky than the garganelli. Garganelli. Well, did you, was it, did you make the macaroni with the whole? We made middle? macaroni. Yeah. Yeah, because on the West Coast, we make busiati, which yes. is like a long fusilli. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and some great. people use other things from umbrellas or bicycles or a wheat right. stock. A wheat stock. Oh, okay. Yeah. What I is the I best just... sauce for busiati? Pardon me? What is the best sauce for buziate? They do um, uh, a red pesto with almonds, the tomato sauce, the pesto oh, from delicious. Trapani. Mm. Um, and this nice, chewy, very rustic pasta sauce. You know what I made the other night? Now, this is interesting for that Moroccan dinner. I wrote one of the salads that I did was carrots. I had never done this before. And then I had these beautiful tops from these small carrots. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do a carrot top pesto. Have you ever done it? Yeah, so yeah, because we have beautiful, when you, get the, when you get the carrots right from the farm, that's oh. like the moment. You can't just really grocery store. No, you can't. Oh my, Judy, that was so delicious. That was like a hit on the table. I just kind of said, I'm not going to throw these away and I threw it together. But you know, I kind of went a little bit in the Moroccan direction. That was so good. I just had never done it. But you're right. You have to have young carrots. And I mean, these the tops were just so beautiful. I just said, I can't throw them away. Yeah, this year I actually planted cilantro because I haven't, I can't go to Florence. I mean, Florence is like right. 30 kilometers, um, but we can't leave our village right now. That's right, yeah. So um, I just thought, well, I'm gonna plant, plant some stuff. I have lemongrass. Um, oh, I bought lemongrass at a grocery store in Florence and I put it in a, a glass of water and it rooted. And so I have three plants in my backyard. And do you have a big garden? No, it's like this big. But I have, oh. I, I especially have herbs. I have asparagus. I have 10 asparagus plants. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because oh, that's, um, that's nice. And then I know a secret spot for asparagus. Um, there's wild asparagus driving all the way up to my house. And right. then there's an abandoned asparagus field. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So. so you're eating a lot of asparagus now. Are you getting they're asparagus? Just, they're just coming up. We just, I had one last week and two this Dang. week. So it's just starting. We had some really okay. cold nights. Yeah, you know, it's been so cold here. It really has. I mean, I shouldn't say that. People that are living, like in I know, California. Um, Robert's in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm talking about cold. It was, it's been in the 50s here. During the day, 56, it's kind of chilly. Anyway, it's humid the, too, right? By the bay, you used to get the fog. Are you getting fog? Yeah, I mean, there's this really cold wind. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. So I was our, thinking I think about just, Napa like, the other day because. Um, they had to bring out the smudge pots and set fire on the vineyards all around here because the they had just gotten the bud and the it got dropped the temperatures dropped and some people lost all their vines already right right yeah um you asked me about what else have i cooked the thing that was really interesting is i did a lot of asian food because you know not going out i love thai food and you know i didn't i'm not a big order out person i didn't i just that's not I, I probably got to go food maybe once or twi twice, but mm -hmm. I just, I like cooking and I just, you know, I, but anyway, I was craving like Thai food or Vietnamese food. So those were some of the things that I made. Like I'd never made larb before. I was oh, eating wow. larb, you know, in the cabbage leaves, but yeah. that was, was so delicious, you know? Yeah, and, I, you um, know, my I actually was, ordered some ingredients online so I could make things. I, uh, the, the, I don't know how to pronounce it. The Kore a Korean red chili paste. Right. I don't know it. Wan right, um, right. Gochujang. What's it called? Gochujang. Thank you. I've never heard anybody say the word. So it's like I can't speak English or Italian anymore. <laughs> but it was it's really good because it's like a combination of flavors that I love here. It's like a Sicilian tomato paste with a little right. kick. Yes. 
I think I actually have that in my refrigerator. There at, at the farmer's market I go to on Sunday morning, there is a, there a couple, a Korean couple, really young and they make this delicious food. They do these beautiful little rolls and, um, but they also have some bottled things that I'm sure that's what I have in my refrigerator. I got it from him. He said, you can add it to everything. He was so excited about it. Um, he said, throw it into a soup. You can put it, but yeah. I haven't yeah, really I've run out, like we we're talking about missing our trips. I've run out of my like um, artisan tomato paste from Sicily. I've run out oh. of my pistachios from Sicily. I've run out oh. of uh, some of the stuff I have from Puglia. Um, and, uh, hey, hard. Judy, we filmed, we filmed in uh, Parma and I filmed with this woman and she made her lasagna and she put um, pistachio, like a pistachio butter in it. Well, that's nice. It's not Parma. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of funny when people are saying that. Huh? I just was curious if you'd ever even heard of that or adding it to lasagna. No. But it's new, the whole thing with the access to pistachios now and oh, that I you see. can order products and that they're doing artisan pizzas with um, oh. a pistachio puree, pistachio, but it always goes like with mortadella. They're serving Ooh, pistachios wow. and mortadella together with whipped ricotta. So I could easily right. imagine those flavors happening. Like when um, Stanley Tucci did his show, you know, right. so many people were upset because it wasn't like the recipe that they knew or he like, well, like when right. you, you know, you know how it is because you do shows all the time, trying to pick a place where you're going to go and use it as your example of what you love, right. isn't necessarily the person that created the recipe. Right, right. But you went there and you love the people and then this is there, it's a respect out of them. You, you do their recipe. Right, exactly. Yeah. But then someone's going to see that and you go, someone's going to go, oh, well, we don't do pistachio exactly. lasagna. Well, she does exactly. pistachio lasagna. Right. Right. You know, I'll never forget the first time I did one of my, and, and it's partly because of you. I was doing the, you know, my tours in Europe and, and it, it, Italy was the first place. I will never forget this. And I was in Tuscany and I wanted to make a cake that had marzipan in it. And, you know, we could buy marzipan, right? In America, you buy everything. And people, this was 20 years ago when I first started or 21 was when I first started doing them. People were like, the, the Italians were like, what do you mean? We can't get marzipan here. That you can only get in the South. And there was a time, right, when you couldn't get things like that, right? No, I, it's only recently I can buy ground almond flour. I mean, you could go, there are Sicilian pastry shops like in Florence. Okay. And they would have a stash. They probably make their own. But for the public, people, number one, don't really make a lot of desserts at home. Right. So oh, there's right. not really oh. the access to all the ingredients like thinly sliced almonds too. You know how we do that uh, decorations like almond tarts and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. like you can just go to the grocery store and buy ingredients to make something from something that's not in your region. Right, right, exactly. That's what I realized it. And I was, I was really surprised. Maybe I was in the Veneto and they looked at me like they were crazy, like crazy. You can get that if you're in Sicily, you can make that in Sicily, but you know, even, okay. So I also work in Spain and I like paella. I mean, they, what the what they call paella is completely different than what we make in the United States as paella. It's so interesting to me. Like they make it with green beans and shell beans wow. and rabbit and chicken. That is a traditional Valencian paella. Okay, anything Valencia. Else, yes. Anything else is called rice with, like rice with seafood, rice with, and my friends that live in Rioja, two of them are from Valencia. So they're talking about how this is just horrible if you make any other and call it paella. It's just, and I've been making paella, but I did learn the basics on how to make paella with them. By the way, I, that's one thing I've been making, paella on the stove for just two of us. And that's, that's been, a, that's been really fun. Yeah, I was telling um, Andrea, I wanted to get a paella pan because, <laughs> and he um, goes, oh, like you need one more pan. <laughs> right. Oh, you need to have a yes. It's so cool to have one for two people though. I love that. I do. I've been doing that a lot. I love that. Well, I have and my copper Chashina pan, which is a, a low pan and I could probably yeah. take it. But yeah. it's just, you know, the whole having, right. I crave international food or, you know, right. things beyond right. Tuscan. And mm -hmm. I think that's when you travel, I think your, your horizons are broadened and the flavors. And the one thing I remember, um, when we were at ICP, and I, I don't remember where we were, at some market, 
and we were walking around and they were having us because you're like a, a a killer palette right i forget what they're called your palette, <laughs> super palette. Palette. it what sounds like it? i'm bragging but super palette super right palette. And I remember we were walking around and they gave us a tomato to taste. And I was like, whoa, this tastes great. She goes, it's the salt. That's good salt, not a good tomato. <laughs> I'll never forget that because of course it was out of season for tomatoes, but he right. did make it taste great. Right. And how sometimes those simple ingredients really also elevate a dish or, no. or bring you somewhere. Right. Oh, that's so true. You know what I think of you as um, you always loved Mexico too, right? Mm -hmm. You love Mexico. I remember you used to go there so a lot, right? We used to go every winter because I taught college kids here. And so there was a break in like December, January. Uh, and I would start again in February. It's freezing cold. Heating is expensive. Right. There's nothing to do. So we would go spend it in Mexico. Right. I know. I remember that. Yeah, because um, you it's kind of crazy that I have a Mexican restaurant and I've written, written 17, 16 cookbooks about the Mediterranean. But I was thinking about you in Mexico. Um, one place I would love to go there that I have never been, I know I'm, this is a total segue, but we're talking about travel, but I would love to go to the wine country there. Have you ever been to that area? No, uh -uh, and I have a lot of friends. Well, the one in Baja? That I uh, actually, to yeah, know? Guadalupe. Guadalupe, yeah. Valle de Guadalupe. It's an area I just would love to go to. I heard it's um, just becoming huge but also a friend of mine from Florence who I met in San Francisco because he was working at one of the five-star hotels okay yeah opened a restaurant in Ensenada Tijuana okay wow yeah he had been wow. gotten into food and food and wine and ho from hotels that's kind of an easy tregway um and he was actually Florentine and I think he just decided he really wanted to cook. And, uh, and for some reason went to Mexico and opened up a restaurant there and it's so popular and it's, you know, real wow. food. Wow. Cause I think I, one of the reasons when I came to Italy too, I wasn't in love with Italy was I wasn't in love with Italian American food really like deep dish pizza and right. spaghetti and meatballs and huge big bowls right. of food and just kind of like thrown on you on the table and people yelling <laughs> and screaming. But, then Larry Mendel, your best friend, right, opened up like Prego, right. And I fell oh, in love with Prego Italian the food at Prego. <gasps> That's that, what he sold me. First, Larry is my partner at Copita, um, and he calls himself Lorenzo because he really thinks he's Italian. And he opened up Prego. Did you know that was the first pizza oven in California? It wasn't Wolfgang. It wasn't Alice. It was Larry. No, Very genius. Thinking always. He's 83 years old, and he's still extraordinary. Um, we have some a couple of changes going on in the restaurant, and he always says the same thing. Judy, you'll love this. When one door closes, another door opens. He's always got these words of wisdom. I just love well, he him. He first brought him. Il Fornaio. That's correct. Yep. And the Il Fornaio, I ended up in Florence living next door to the Il Fornaio in Florence person who Larry right. must have contacted and he didn't want to leave his mother. So he didn't go and he hired somebody else to go. Um, oh, that's so the, funny. Because yeah. it's uh, Il Fornaio is a chain in Italy, right? Yes. So yes, he started it when there was one in the United. I mean, he took took it over when there was one restaurant, and he sold it when there were twenty three. I think there's still twenty three, and he's not involved with it anymore. But um, no, he's just he just is a very he's a brilliant restaurateur, really, and so well respected. Like in our in my restaurant, our restaurant, he. I mean, our uh, some of our um, investors are people like Rich Melman from Let Us Entertain You in Chicago. Wow. I mean, wow. He did, names because they know when you work with Larry it's going to be a great you know great restaurant but a he's lot such, of, he's I mean, such a, a visionary of, such a visionary he is, he is. extraordinary man tell him I said hi I will I and will. also tell Tony I said hi the bartender oh Tony with the little tie that he likes to cut he loves to cut it oh and we yes Tony Negroni yeah. Tony Negroni yeah. uh, anyway. we used to go there all the time I just loved it and it was so great because he brought three different tastes of Italy in Prego, right? There was like the Milanese hot spot where everyone's in their silk right. and leather. And there was the family style dining. And then there was like the, the wine bar kind of casual. And it's funny because um, one of my best friends in Florence, who I didn't know then, because I hadn't been to Florence yet, worked for Larry oh. at that Prego. Really? And then when I had lived in Italy and I went back to Prego to eat and I brought Andrea because I thought he would want some real Italian food. 
Andrea's looking down at the menu, trying to figure things out. I'm right. translating. The waiter comes up. I'm trying to tell the waiter something. I say something to Andrea in Italian. And it was one of his friends from Florence that was our waiter. You're kidding. And that was, that was just great. That was great. Oh, and I, another so guy great. that I ended up living next to here was also a waiter at Prego. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I still remember. I remember the guy, that, the pizzaiolo. He was so cute. I think they brought him from Italy. I'm pretty sure. There were so did. many Italians there. It was great. It was great. So that the was other thing great. I loved at Copita, because I went once with, um, who did I go with? With Kate Hill from France and right. uh, Steve okay. from Rancho Gordo. Right. Oh, he's so great too, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. But That's I great. loved, you made those little buenelos, how do you call them? Buenuelos. Buenuelos. Out of the yeah. masa? That was yeah. genius. Genius. I know. They're so light. They're unbelievable. We do those because our whole restaurant, you know, a lot of Mexican food is um, gluten-free. And so we, our restaurant is 100% gluten-free and that's kind of a decision we made, but those buñuelos are made with cup for cup flour. And that recipe, I mean, those, they melt in your mouth and probably when you had them, I'm not sure what sauce, but we changed it because I wanted to have a chocolate sauce. I just think yeah. it would be, I thought it would be so good. But when you come back, when we can all travel again, we have to go to Copita together, drink it's some like, margaritas and well, make and I believe saw we're you in and with the other day. And I'm like, I need a margarita. <laughs> I need a right. smoking mezcal, you know? I know, I know. We and have yes, I could buy bottles and do it for myself, but I like being waited on. Um, yeah, you know, okay. So the first time, speaking of COVID, so I basically had been home for like, I don't know, nine months or something. And I, I hadn't been to Copita at all just because I wanted to be careful and I hadn't been out. And I went to Copita. Um, I think I'd only been there once, maybe towards the beginning. So this was my second time. And I sat down and Joe and I were going to have dinner and they started waiting on me, Judy. I was so uncomfortable because I'd been, you know, Joe and I were waiting on ourselves all that time. And honestly, I felt like I needed to get up and get my own silverware. Like when I wanted a glass of something, it, it, I was, I'm getting used to it now, but I was so uncomfortable. It's so funny. It was just like, I hadn't done it in a long time, but now I'm ready did to be waiting. Did you guys on. have to close or did you keep doing food to go or because you, so you have a little outdoor food. dining there? There's been so many iterations, right? There was food to go. We closed for a little while. Then we had food to go and then we had to stop that again. And then we started up again. And now what's great is Marin County. I think it's today is opening up to yellow tier. That's the first oh, one. So that means that we will be able to right now we're open 50%, but I think that even goes up to, I don't know if it's a hundred or 75% or something. So it's pretty, yeah, it's extraordinary. Anyway, if anybody has questions, you can put them in our little chat box, Judy. And I have a chat box. Yeah. She even shared it with me. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to see it open again. And okay. So when we started opening again with, um, we still have, now we have a pretty strong to-go business, which is interesting. We didn't really have it as much before, but um, now uh, that we're eating indoors, our, I mean, our business has definitely picked up and uh, it just feels a lot better. The energy's better. I think this summer is going to be pretty busy in Sausalito. I just mm -hmm. think, you know, the city's still really quiet. Like, you know, I live near Fillmore Street and that's better, but downtown, it's pretty quiet. But it's, it's getting better. Are people still working from home? Yes. I mean, some of the, yeah. I mean, some are coming back. I know Facebook is coming back. I do know that because my brother's involved with that. But um, I, people are working from home, but some of the businesses are coming back. Um, and we've had our stores have been open. Like you haven't even had that, right? You haven't had stores. Well, I, we have besides we have leave our village. <laughs> I mean, we, had, um, we had a little window, I think, during last summer, and we went to Florence oh. and ate with friends outside, spaced right. out and stuff like that, and that was really nice. Um, but we've been in, like, what for us, orange zone and uh, red zone oh, for wow. so long, um, the holidays, of course. I just think here, too, because Italians are just so tend to want to be in groups and families and stuff. I know. That, I know. Um, and it was spreading. What they do is they count how, no, how many hospital beds do you have available. And right. um, the way that we're grouped in, we're grouped in with a, a, a larger community. Um, our town is 16,000 people in our little area. Right. But we're grouped in with a, the bigger uh, core town, Empoli, which is outside of Florence as part of the area. And so they're they're they don't have a lot of hospital beds available. So we just went to um, Orange and then they just put a new lot, which I think our colors mean something different. 
I think so too, yeah. Because orange means we can't leave our village still. And if we go to yellow, yeah. I think that means we can move around in our region. Oh, yeah. I accidentally went to Dario's one day because I forgot. You did? It oh, Judy, so you good, know, you, though. I yeah, know. 40 kilometers away, but it's in a different yeah. region, area of the town. And I wasn't supposed to go, but he, he built a food truck. <clears throat> oh, he did. And he had it before COVID where um, uh, he was doing a hamburger and it was just delicious. And yeah. uh, so he's closed his restaurants and the, the food truck is open. And there's uh, and up in the back parking lot, there's uh, picnic tables he set up and has little places to sit, but you can get it and go oh, or you can, great. but he also has some tables outside on a patio and it's And covered. you can do that? Huh? That's okay? That's okay to do that? It's Italy, I don't know. Yeah, right. I saw, you know, just saw um, too that somebody was on the Autostrada and like all the restaurants are closed. So people are just like <gasps> dying. Businesses wow. are closing. Restaurants right. have been open for 25 years are, are going bankrupt and closing. Oh. And, um, but somebody showed a picture of on the Autostrada that people were sitting down eating and that should be against the law. Right, wow. Yeah. You know, Dario, one thing is you, you probably should explain to people if they don't know Dario, because he's so extraordinary, but you introduced me to him and I wrote about him so many years ago when I was writing for the Chronicle. Um, but I, you know, the restaurant that I love, Mick Dario, I loved sitting out there and having that. Exactly. So the food that. truck is in the garden back there and oh, it's um, it charcoal grilled little, uh, you know, those little ape trucks, the three wheeled trucks. Yeah. 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 I love those. So yeah. it has a little uh, charcoal grill in the back now. And two guys stand up in there and he made like a Dario naze instead of mayonnaise. So it's an eggless mayonnaise with Tuscan herbs in it. And he's doing, oh, what did I have the last time? He was doing um, a pork belly that was cooked for 12 hours. Mm. Wow. Then vacuum packed and sealed so it would firm up and refrigerated. And then they sliced it and grilled it and it was delicious. Oh, yeah. And I forget the sauce they had on that, but you know, the perfect bread, the perfect sauce, slow right. cooking. So it like rendered a lot of the fat and it was just delicious. And then he oh, got the, was doing I want to eat that. I want to eat that. Yeah. I thought I was going to go for my birthday. And so yesterday I was like, what time were we meeting? And I go, you guys, we're orange. We can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. You know, it's funny. I know that you opened for a while because Valentina in Bologna, she said she was so excited. She was, you've met Valentina, but yeah. she said, I'm going out with my friends and we're going to have lunch. It was like a Sunday and the next day you closed down again. It was like you opened up for like a minute, right? A minute. Yeah. And everyone went crazy. And I think, you know, it happened wow. last summer. We hardly had any cases whatsoever here. And then kids wow. went to like Greece on vacation. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they all came back and all of a sudden grandma's sick, you know, and it's just, yeah. and then it just started spreading because people just didn't, weren't right. paying attention. I think too relaxed, really. I mean, between Greece opening and, and now they're saying France, I just saw yesterday or last It's night. very limited. France is opening to EU and it's, I think it's going to be okay. like Italy where they're opening to all the EU people. You can come for business, not real tourism, but there's, they right. also have a lot of people studying abroad there. Um, right. And then we'll see. So I saw a month ago, all the American airlines or whatever were saying, oh yeah, we're going to be flying into Florence. They we're flying into right. Italy and right. people have been flying around all the whole time for work or if you have a residence. I mean, Frances oh. Mays was here last summer. She, you know, she has her home here and her, her nephew was studying abroad for the, for the summer program. So she was here last summer. People who own homes can come to their homes. Okay. But you can't go on vacation really. Right, right, okay. So, and even if you could come to your home, you still have to follow those rules. Right. So you can't yeah. be driving around. So um, I see that plate behind you, Judy. Um, and you know, I love oh, plates. Yeah. Been to, yes, it's beautiful. Um, I think we've even, have we been, I think we've been to Deruta before, have we together? I can't, I know I've been there with, well, we tried with Mary Angela, but it, we didn't make it. Um, but uh, I love that plate. It's beautiful. Yeah, I just, there's, I love how each region has their own plates. And I do too. It was, you know, in Sicily, that was another thing. I went to Calta Girone. Those were really beautiful too. Yes. I love those steps. What is it? 152 yeah, stairs. Yeah, with all the designs. All the yeah. oh, beautiful. Beautiful, just gorgeous. Beautiful. 
Yeah. I remember it was funny because I had a friend who saw a cookbook and he said, I want this bowl on the cookbook. All right. And there was no credit in the cookbook to where the bowl was from. And I said, well, you know, we're staying with a noble family here. They might know, you know, right. and damned if they didn't. So we showed them the book. She goes, oh yeah, that's, you know, Giuseppe Alessi, Calta Gironi, just go there. Oh, so we Giuseppe Alessi. It. Yeah. I, yes, I know that. Yeah, I know their stuff. It, wait, isn't that the dad is, uh, the son is now kind of taken over the business a little bit and the dad's the one that- He does the, the very creative things. He has, there were fish on the top of the, the bowl. Fish. Yes. Because yes, we have one, we, it's not my villa where I work, but on the center of the table, there's a huge one with the fish. They're and then beautiful. they have birds. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. It was beautiful. so great because we just punched it into like Google Maps. <laughs> And drove yeah. right up in front of the shop. And it was just like, By the way, the other, chances of that, you know? But the best thing about that is we, we went all the way there and everybody's buying all the stuff and they wanted these bowls made. We got to the airport and they have a whole store. So you oh, can no. buy it now right at the airport. Yes. Perfect. But anyway, yeah. we but were Sicilian laughing. Sicilian ceramics. Oh my God, I'm addicted. They're beautiful. I have yeah. one guy who does um, lesterware. Lusterware. That antique lusterware where it looks like it's right. metallic on yes. the inside. Wow. Yeah. Ugh. I know. Oh, that's so great. Now, where is that made? Is there any? I know. In Shaka. Is, oh, in Shaka. Oh, I know Shaka. Okay. This plate, can you see this one? Am I pointing? That big one? Yeah. One? Uh, okay. That's Shaka. That's from Shaka. Well, I, the, yeah. The colors. But, um, and the other thing, these, these behind, this one also is from Shaka. But what I love about Shaka is there's so much movement in their pieces right yeah. they're, so, they're so beautiful then you like don't find the, the classic like i see like you have your lemon one back there that kind of reminds right. me of chianti and stuff like that right right lemon behind you on the other side that one no but the other shoulder uh, oh your other, here no. no no turn the other way and look turn back now way. it's that lemon one right there in the middle lemon. shelf isn't that a lemon this, uh, there's a grape one and the, the octagonal, like it looks like lemons. No, uh, I see yellow. This one? No, no. shelf above. Middle. To the right, there, left, right, there. That, what? is it lemons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that one? Yes. But you know what else? Oh, that one up there. Can you see that one? That no, not really. One? Kind of amazing, that plate. Anyway, that one was made by this guy, Marco Torelli. Do you know his work? But anyway, he did. He paints um, pottery that is um, to look. Uh, I guess it was a gift that a husband gave to his wife. Oh in yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful stuff, and it's always with an initial. But that he does a lot of white on white. Oh my God, I love his stuff. It's beautiful. But you know, I haven't been to Jeruta in a long time. I need to go back. Mm -hmm. I need to. I just want to be there. I just want to be there, Judy. I know the first before I want to tell everybody before Judy and I were talking, I was like, Judy, when can we come back? We were trying to figure out when it is, but I think we have a few months to go. I think so. And I just, you know, I hate to plan things and get disappointed. I think I next spring is going to be fabulous. Next May will right. be great. And I think if we could just hold out and maybe do more research and check things out and, and plan and let the first people, it's going to be hordes, but I'm waiting right. for like to see when the, the poor people working in the restaurants and the hotels are going to be get their vaccines. I know. And, you know, that's the great thing that we've done in the U.S. is we vaccinated the people that are in hospitality, which has Very been smart. great, smart. Yeah. you know. Um, and so like people at Copita at my restaurant, they were vaccinated pretty early on. So, you know, that's been great. So been great um, for them. I'm going to um, close out the Facebook one now. Later, I'll show you there's all these notes from people on Facebook over for you, too. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. So let me just um, come over here and then we can stop that. So, and um, I want to thank you for coming and I'm going to stop the recording here and then we'll open up our Zoom and people can chit chat.